The theological term here is theosis. Theosis. It is a temporary lowering, not in nature, but position. Let's read the verses first of all. We'll commence in verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now remember, Christ Jesus is him in eternity. Jesus Christ is him on earth. When it puts the messianic title first, it's talking about him in eternity. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. What we have here is a New Testament parody to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, Ishael Nun Gimel, where because he willingly submits himself to God's will as an atonement, that he's allotted the booty with the strong and a portion with the great. It, it basically is a New Testament interpretation of the fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. Now, let's begin at the beginning. This idea of theosis, a temporary lowering in position. There was a book by the American author that was a docufiction written by Mark Twain, the American author. And Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorne Clemens, wrote a book called The Prince and the Pauper, a docufiction, as it were, about the childhood experience of Edward VI in England. It's interesting that it was an American author who wrote this story, and it became a classic, in fact, an epic Walt Disney film, The Prince and the Pauper the prince and the pauper, where Edward VI, anxious to find out what it's like to be an ordinary boy in London or in England, manages somehow to find someone who looks so much like him that it could have been his identical twin. So he persuades for a while this poor boy from the slums of London to take his place while he goes down to the slums of London and tries to experience life as a real person doing the things he was not permitted to do as prince in Hampton Palace. So he does it. He leaves Hampton Palace, and he goes into London down the Thames, and he jumps in the mud with the other boys, etc., etc. In the meantime, a crisis takes place with the death of Henry VIII, and everything with um, Thomas Cranmer and, and, and Lady Jane Grey, all these characters come into play in the story. The prince, Edward VI, remained the prince, the prince of Wales, an heir to becoming the king of England. He remained in that position. Objectively, that's who he was. Subjectively, by experience, however, he was just an ordinary boy in the slums and streets of London, of, of, in medieval England. That's all he was. His position did him absolutely no good. He put himself in a situation where he wound up in peril voluntarily, but then regains his position rightly and becomes king in the end of the film when he's crowned by, by Cranmer as, as, as the king of England. Docufiction, based on true historical characters and a true historical setting, but it's a make-believe story. Nonetheless, it shows what happened with Christ. It follows the same idea of theosis, a temporary abandonment of position like the prince and the pauper. He doesn't stop being the prince of Wales. He remains the prince of Wales. He does not stop being heir to the throne of, of England as emperor and king. He remains it. But subjectively, he does not experience it until the end of the film. So it is with the Lord Jesus. For our sakes, for our sakes, he empties himself, not of his deity, but of the privilege of his deity, and becomes man. God becomes man in the person of Christ. Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Not 50-50, as in the Greek concept of a divine man with Hercules, 
whose father was Zeus, but mother was a woman in Greek mythology, but no myth, actual fact, God becomes a man who is 100% human and 100% divine. The privilege of his deity did him no good. To understand this, we can look to passages such as the temptation narrative in Matthew chapter 4. Satan was trying to get Jesus to use his divine power out of concert with his father. Jesus could have walked on the water because he was God, but he didn't. He did it by the power of the Holy Spirit because his father told him to. Jesus could have fed the 5,000 because he was God with his own power, but didn't. So too, in the temptation narrative, he could have changed the stones into bread. He could have done any of those things. Satan was trying to get Jesus to use his divine power independent of his father, but Jesus would not do it. It's showing him as the last Adam. The first Adam fell out of fellowship with God because of sin. Satan was trying to get Jesus as the last Adam to do what the first Adam did. That is why in Mark's account of the temptation narrative, it describes Jesus as being with the animals. It's trying to show him as an Adamic figure, similar to Adam in the same situation. But while the first Adam blew it, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, I'll give you all these kingdoms, the second Adam did not blow it. In God's economy, there are only, there are only two generic men, the first Adam and the last one. The first Adam being Adam, the husband of Eve, and the last Adam being Christ, God who became a man. When people are born, they are in the character and the descent of Adam. When they are born again, they become in the character and descent of Christ. He dwells within us. He puts something divine within us. Not that we become deified, but he who is deity dwells in us by his spirit. Two men. In order to achieve this, God had to become a man and succeed where the first Adam failed. When you're born, you're in Adam. When you're born again, you're in Christ, the last Adam, as the New Testament describes him. Now, this is very, very important. Jesus never once used the power or privilege of his deity. He totally relied upon his Father to achieve these things. But what we read is a Christological statement, something about the nature of him. He existed in the form of God, but did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Until we see what Stephen saw at his martyrdom in the book of Acts, when he was filled with the Spirit and he saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father, until that happens, or until the rapture, we will not be able to understand the triunity of the Godhead in its fullness. We can only understand the Trinity, the triunity, partially. We can understand it enough to know it's true, and Jesus explains the dynamics of the interrelationship between or among the three persons of the Godhead in John's Gospel. We can understand it up to a point. We can understand it enough to know it's true and to understand it functionally. But we cannot understand its actual substance as in beholding it until we reach the point that Stephen did. This side of eternity, before we enter eternity, we will not be able to understand the hypostatic relationship within the Godhead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus, being fully God, we couldn't understand that. It is interesting to note that in John's Gospel, Jesus is described as the true light that was coming into the world. The Word, the eternal logos of God, became flesh. God becomes man. The world was made through him. In the old physics of Newton, as I've explained before, matter was matter and energy was energy. Light, being <coughs> waves, was energy. But an evangelical physicist named Rutherford, with his famous experiments with light particles, 
was able to determine by means of experiments firing light particles onto a gold plate that light particles, photons, had mass. Hence, in the old Newtonian physics, energy was energy and matter was matter. The two could not be the same. But in the new physics, it could be both. Light could be both energy and matter. Now, this, of course, is one of the things that paved the way for relativity <clears throat> and for Einstein's theory of energy equals matter times the velocity of light squared. It helped pave the way for that new thinking in a new physics that would be placed Newtonian physics. Light could be both matter and energy. Jesus could be both God and man. Quite a situation. And it's interesting that John uses, uses light in John chapter 1. We cannot fully understand these things beyond a limited point. It's not something we can grasp. It's futile to try to understand or explain the Trinity beyond a limited point, the point that Scripture describes and explains it, primarily in John's Gospel, where Jesus explains the relationship between the Father, Himself, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Yet we know it's true. And we know one day we will know as we have been fully known. Well, let's continue looking at this. Because we couldn't comprehend this, he empties himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Notice he's in the form of God. He's divine. But then he's in the form of man, a bondservant. Now, the idea of bondservant has to be understood according to the Torah. Jews did not allow slavery of a fellow believer. A fellow Hebrew could not be enslaved. A Gentile who converted and be believed in the one true God could not be enslaved. It was voluntary. At Passover, they would drive a gold nail through the earlobe into a doorpost in a ritual, committing themselves to voluntarily be a legally bound bondservant, self-indenturing, auto-indenturism to a benevolent master. Jesus chose to do it. He had a choice. That choice he bequeaths to us. God does not force people to repent and believe the gospel and accept Christ. We have that choice to be his bondservant. But if we do, we have to do what he did. Pick up our cross and follow him. Trust God for a future glorification as Jesus did. Let's continue looking at the text being in the appearance as a man. There were early heretical sects with false Christologies, particularly the Docetists, who denied this. They said he only appeared to be a man. That is, when he walked on the beach, he didn't really leave footprints in the sand. No, no. The word became flesh. This became a major problem in the Greek world. This was not something that Paul would have written to a Jewish church. It's not something that would be an issue among Jewish believers that you would see in Jude or Peter or James or Hebrews, an epistle written to Jews. This was an issue in Philippi in the Greek culture or the Greco-Roman world because the Greeks believed in the imp impassibility of God, that God could not become flesh. Greeks had the concept of the logos, of the creative word of God. They had the concept of logos. But the idea of the Logos becoming flesh, they could not handle. Hence, these pagan ideas began to infiltrate the early church after the time of the apostles, or even incipiently, perhaps, at the end of the first century. This idea of docetism and certain other Gnostic heresies that denied the literal incarnation physiologically and metabolically of the Lord Jesus. Well, let's continue looking at this. For this reason also, God highly exalted him, so that every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth, and of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Remember at Gensarim, the demoniac, the demons began to speak to the demoniac, 
have you come to torture us before the time, son of man? A time will come when even Satan will worship Jesus. Even Satan and his demons will worship the Lord Jesus and have no option but to do so. A time will come. Satan in the temptation narrative attempts to get Jesus to worship him by spiritual seduction. It doesn't work. But Satan himself will ultimately, ultimately even have to worship Jesus. Now, this is not to say that they have salvation. This led to another error in the early church, which has shown its ugly face repeatedly and is surfacing again today. It was something that was propagated, among others, by Oregon, Oregon and Alexandria, called ultimate reconciliation, the idea that even Satan would be saved. This is completely false, completely false. Coming from this ultimate reconciliation was an aberrational doctrinal belief called ultimate reconciliation for not necessarily Satan, but for fallen man. Nobody will go to hell. Everybody will ultimately be saved. This idea of universalism or universal salvation, even apart from those who had a personal saving faith in Jesus. The primary proponent of this lie of Satan today which dates back to the early church and its false Christology and its false eschatology, is Rob Bell. Rob Bell, a messenger of the wicked one. Um, he wrote a book called Love Wins, and he denies that there's going to be eternal hell. There are more sanitized versions of this lie. One of the propagators of the lie was the late John Stott, who said we cannot teach there's eternal hell. This is called annihilationism. Well, these people may not be saved, but God will not judge them eternally as he does Satan. Another is Roger Foster in the UK. Again, if hell is not eternal and conscious, we have no scriptural basis to say heaven is. I've explained this multiple times. And now, pal, and now, nays. Forever and ever, the smoke of their torment goes up from age to ages. In Hebrew, would be oleme olamin a separate subject dealing with um, the, the lie of annihilationism, but understanding that annihilationism and universalism derive from the ancient heresies of Oregon and those who follow him of ultimate reconciliation. Now, what the Holy Spirit was doing here through Paul's writing in Philippians was preempting what was going to come, preempting docetism, preempting ultimate reconciliation. The Lord knew that the church was going to be seduced by these lies shortly after the time of the apostles, and that's exactly what happened. Hence, this is a very, very important passage concerning Christology, concerning our understanding of the triunity of the Godhead, concerning the foreknowledge of God, concerning a correct New Testament interpretation of Isaiah 52 and 53, the servant songs of Ishayahu Hanavi, the prophecies of the crucifixion of Jesus, and so forth. And, of course, a polemic against the false Christologies and false doctrines that would soon follow related to it, such as the teachings of Oregon. So that is the background and the basis of these passages in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. He takes the form of a servant. Again, the easiest way to explain it to a child or a young believer is The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain. That is a good parody, a good parody. You know, so much of the literary classics from secular literature, such as, uh, you know, A Tale of Two Cities or The Prince and the Pauper, these books are adopted on biblical themes. They parody scripture. I think of uh, even, even in film. East of Eden with, with James Dean and things like that. The parallels the book of Genesis with the two sons, Cain and Abel. So many of the classics we have in, in, in secular literature and, and even, in, even in film uh, derive from a biblical motif. Uh, unfortunately, the world only looks at the secular literature or the Hollywood film. It doesn't look at where the authors or the script writers got the idea. And the idea, of course, comes from the Word of God. Um, that's true in Shakespearean literature. 
It's true in modern literature. There's nothing like the word of God. And so we read in Philippians. Theosis. God becomes a man without ceasing to be God, but putting aside the power and privilege of his deity voluntarily in order to redeem us. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for your question. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.